It's a December 6th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour, starting with Israeli military's grip on Khan Yunus. Israeli forces have now stormed into Gaza's second largest city, where hospitals are becoming overwhelmed. Watchers fear for civilians as many had fled to the area to escape fighting in northern Gaza. The rate of food prices in South Korea went up last month despite consumer prices slowing, while job openings over in the U.S. dropped to the lowest level in over two years, indicating signs of consumer prices being tamed. South Korea has sketched up plans to cut the country's suicide rate, which is the highest among the OECD countries, by half within 10 years. Mental health checkups for those in their 20s and 30s will be offered every two years instead of the current 10 years. Israeli forces have now reached the heart of the southern city of Khan Yunis. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the Israel Defense Forces should retain control of the region for the disarmament of Gaza after the war. Our Yisin Zesser Tosof. The Israel Defense Forces on Tuesday reached southern Gaza's main city of Khan Yunis, marking what they called the most intense day of combat in five weeks of ground operations against Hamas. Backed by warplanes and tanks, the IDF reached the heart of the city where many Palestinians who fled since the start of the armed conflict are now situated. According to the chief of Israel's general staff, Israeli forces have secured many Hamas strongholds in the northern Gaza Strip and are now operating against the strongholds in the south. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu stressed that the Israel Defense Forces should retain control of the region following the disarmament of Gaza and the end of the war, shooting down any notion that an international force could be responsible for security in the Gaza Strip. I want to say a word about the day after Hamas. Gaza needs to be demilitarized. But in order for Gaza to be demilitarized, there's just one force that can demilitarize it, and that power is the IDF. No international force can be responsible for that. We saw in other places what happened when they brought in international forces to demilitarize them. I am not willing to close my eyes and accept any other arrangement. Gaza's health ministry says the death toll among Palestinians since the start of the armed conflict has now surpassed 16,000, with some 40,000 others injured. With the dire situation in Gaza, the World Health Organization appealed for protection for the health system against further attacks. The UN Health Agency says with more civilians in southern Gaza receiving immediate evacuation orders and being forced to move, more people are being concentrated into smaller areas, while the remaining hospitals in those areas run without sufficient fuel, medicine, food, water or protection from health workers. It added that the number of functioning hospitals in the Gaza Strip has dropped from 36 to 18, with some treating two to three times more patients than they were designed for. Arirang News. Israeli military's group on Gaza is further deepening, with its forces now operating in the southern city of Khan Yunus. Is another temporary ceasefire between Israel and Hamas not possible at all? For more, let's turn to Professor Austin Nuba this morning. Welcome. Thanks for having me back. Pleasure to be here. Sure. Expanding its grip on southern Gaza, Israel says its troops are now in the heart of Khan Yunus. Professor Nupe, what will happen when there are Israeli forces in every part of Gaza? So right now we're seeing the offensive move south, and the problem is that uh, to date we've already had 80 percent of the Gaza Strip um, dislocated. That's about 1.8 million people. So as the military offensive continues south, more people will be displaced for their homes, and it will be increasingly difficult to flee given damage to infrastructure roads, electricity, et cetera. And so it's going to continue to exacerbate the humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip. Definitely. Israel is warning Palestinians to evacuate specific areas in the south. But the problem is residents are saying that there is no safe place to go. Now, that means the pressure is also mounting on the U.S. over the number of civilian casualties. What actions do you think the U.S. can or must take at this stage of the war? Well, what we've seen in the past 60 days since the conflict began is a tension in U.S. foreign policy with that of domestic politics. With respect to foreign policy, the vice president spoke the other day about 
the need of the Israeli Defense Forces to limit civilian casualties, though it's unlikely that the U.S. government will condition uh, continued U.S. military assistance to Israel given the prospects of a presidential election next year. And so um, on the record, the Biden administration is insisting that the Israelis respect a discriminate targeting between militants and civilians and behind the scenes is negotiating uh, for the release of further hostages while also paying attention to the presidential election in the coming year. And so it's very difficult to strike a consistent uh, policy with U.S. audiences and international ones. It is quite tricky at this stage of the war. Now, is another ceasefire possible then? In the near future, do you think after the collapse of the troops, um, what's your take on the possibility? or hopes for another temporary truce really low now? Uh, it's certainly possible. All war is a form of politics by their means. And so what we see is uh, adversaries will fight, they'll pause for diplomacy, and these things happen simultaneously. And so I wouldn't put it beyond the realm of possibility, but the terms... Um, are unlikely to favor the Israelis. It's going to be a continued release of Israeli prisoners for more um, Palestinians at a ratio that is difficult for the Netanyahu government to uh, communicate to the Israeli people. At the same time, the Netanyahu government is incredibly unpopular with the average Israeli voter, um, including over the hostage uh, situation. And uh, Netanyahu's um, really failure to meaningfully engage with the families of the hostages that were taken. Right. And so it's going to be a, a dip diplomatic effort between the Americans, the Qatari government, and the Israelis. Right. The uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said himself that it will be difficult to bring all the hostages uh, back to their hometowns. Now, the World Health Organization's executive board is also set to hold a very rare this emergency meeting on December 10 to discuss the health crisis in Gaza and also in the West Bank. Can we expect anything fruitful to come out of that meeting? What do you think? Well, the World Health Organization is certainly going to uh, continue to push for a ceasefire, pause in the fighting uh, as the humani uh, humanitarian crisis worsens. It's quite concerning um, when we think about the water supply as well. There was uh, reporting in the past uh, days that the Israeli government is planning on using uh, pumping seawater into the tunnels in Gaza as a way to uh, deactivate the tunnels from being used by Hamas. But we have no idea of the effect that will have on sewage and fresh water. And so um, as combat tactics continue to evolve, it's going to further pressure the humanitarian uh, um, stress, particularly on hospitals. About half of the hospitals now are still seeing patients, and those hospitals that are open are at two or three times capacity. Sure. Professor Nupea, before I let you go, now sure. Israeli forces are expanding its military ground operations in southern Gaza. It's saying that it's made into its way into the Khan Yunus. After Khan Yunus, where do you think the Israeli military forces will head? I would imagine they would continue the, the uh, military offensive south towards the Rafah crossing. Mm. And in, in, in the meantime, further displacing Palestinians uh, that are currently located in the south. And so it's going to continue that offensive. It's claimed to date that it's killed something like four or 5,000 Hamas militants. That's uh, nearly impossible to externally verify. Uh, given the 16,000 casualties uh, that are uh, 16,000 fatalities that have been uh, recorded to date. Um, a lot will depend on international diplomacy and whether or not uh, the Americans, Qatari government uh, with Hamas can um, negotiate a, a continued or a future pause in the fighting. Definitely. All right. Thanks so much, Professor Nube, for joining us all the way from Utah this morning. You enjoy your evening. Thanks you as well. Fresh data on job openings in the U.S. has shown that the labor market is cooling and aligning with the Fed's tough action to bring down inflation. Now, the lower-than-expected figure was met with a mixed reaction from the financial markets. Our Moon hye has the details. Job openings in the United States dropped to the lowest level in more than two years, signaling a cooling labor market on the back of high interest rates. According to the U.S. Labor Department on Tuesday, the number of job openings fell to 8.7 million in October, a sharp drop from 9.3 million the month before. 
It's the lowest number of job openings since March 2021 and is also lower than the expected 9.4 million job openings projected by Dow Jones. This decline is significant as labor market conditions are considered by the Federal Reserve when forming their interest rate policies. Despite the Fed's aggressive rate hikes to ease inflation, the U.S. job market has been surprisingly resilient. This latest figure, however, suggests that higher interest rates are finally dampening demand for workers. It also falls in line with data released last week that showed consumer spending slowing in October. With this latest announcement, Wall Street had a mixed end to trading on Tuesday amid expectations that the Fed could start cutting interest rates soon and the 10-year Treasury yield falling to its lowest level since September this year. The benchmark S&P 500 sector indexes and the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell, while the tech-heavy Nasdaq gained 0.31%. So I see a, a dichotomy as to what's going on in the market today between bonds being very bullish Yet it looks like, obviously, that stocks are a little bit more um, cautious about the outlook for their prospects going forward. The financial markets have shown fluctuations throughout the past few months, with the S&P 500 index rising by over 10 percent in November from late October, amid hopes that the Federal Reserve has halted their rate hikes. It's widely expected that rates will stay unchanged at the Fed's FOMC meeting next week, but some stock markets investors are reportedly betting on rate cuts in March next year. More economic indicators are due to be released before the December interest policy is announced, such as the November jobs report. Moon Haryan, Arirang News. With the delayed urea imports destined for South Korea from China, sources now suggest a curb in shipments next year. But Beijing has reportedly expressed a willingness to continue its supply chain cooperation with Seoul. Our Song Yujin reports. On top of recent delays of urea imports destined for South Korea from China, there could also be a curb in shipments next year. According to China's Nitrogen Fertilizer Association on Tuesday, its biggest 15 urea-producing companies, including Sinochem and CNAMPGC, have agreed to cap their exports to 944,000 tons in 2024. The NFA stated that urea shipments from China will come to a halt until the first quarter of next year, leading to the possibility of a reduced supply to South Korean firms. Chinese media have also reported that urea exports have been temporarily suspended and that the supply will decrease significantly before Chinese New Year's Day. This comes following reports from Korean companies that there have been disruptions in their ordered urea supplies passing through Chinese customs, which was confirmed by the South Korean government. The chemical is used as fertilizer in farming and is a key fluid used to reduce emissions from diesel vehicles. More than 90 percent of urea used in South Korean diesel vehicles in October came from China, and between January and October alone this year, urea imports from China totaled nearly 3.4 million tons. Seoul's Tree Ministry consulted with Beijing over these delays and reported that they were the result of a tight domestic urea supply rather than having a political background. Chinese authorities reaffirmed this message by expressing their hope that supply chain cooperation between the two countries would continue smoothly, adding it would seek a solution to customs clearance issues. The two countries' trade authorities also held a joint committee meeting on Tuesday to speed up negotiations for the second phase of a free trade agreement. Urea prices hit a two-year high in China last month, and concerns have spiked over the possibility of a repeat of the 2021 supply shortage when China halted all urea exports. The South Korean government reassured domestic firms, saying that there was currently enough urea in stock to last around three months. They will also be seeking ways to diversify import channels. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Despite consumer prices slowing in November, the rate of food price increases jumped compared to the previous month. The restaurant price inflation rate, a representative food price index among consumer prices, rose 4.8 percent in November. That's higher than the core consumer price of 3.3 percent. The rate has exceeded the overall inflation average for 30 consecutive months, while processed food prices have remained above the overall average for 24 months. A sharp rise in agricultural product, uh, product prices, which have been stable recently, is driving the increases, with the price of fruit jumping by over 24 percent. 
The South Korean government has rolled up its sleeves to tackle having the highest suicide rates among OECD members. Now, the goal is to cut the rates by half within a decade. Our Choi Soo-hyung tells us how. With South Korea ranking first for suicide rates among the OECD countries last year, the Ministry of Health and Welfare has unveiled new initiatives that aim to better deal with mental health issues. President Yoon Sogo explains that the plan is all encompassing. To improve old mental health policies which focused on after-the-fact treatment and not on prevention, the new approach is more proactive and highlights four key tasks. Firstly, the government aims to build a system that's integrated into daily life. This involves launching mobile mental health checkups via the messaging application Kakao Talk and integrating the suicide prevention emergency hotline under a brand new number 109. They also plan to increase counseling support for young people at universities and in workplaces. Secondly, there'll be swift and continuous treatment and management of severe patients. The government also will increase financial support for outpatient care by keeping in touch with those who have had severe mental health problems. As for the long-term strategy for people with severe mental health issues, there will be better housing support for economically independent living. They will also be officially recognised as a socially vulnerable group and more people will be eligible for medical insurance even if they have a record of mental health issues. At the moment, some insurance companies don't offer cover to such people. Lastly, they will improve awareness of mental illnesses to dispel prejudice. Efforts will be made through nationwide campaigns and university club activities so that mental illnesses are seen in a similar way to physical ailments. The Minister of Health and Welfare Ministry Cho Kyu Hong says that with bold investments in mental health care, it will build a society where everyone can integrate. The government will provide mental health care services to all nationals and residents whenever and wherever through these policies and build a society where people with mental illnesses can integrate into society without problems. Though a specific start date hasn't been revealed, though these four main strategies the government plans to provide psychological counselling to one million people by 2027 and reduce the suicide rates by 50 percent within 10 years. Che Soo-hyung, Arirang News. An OECD report suggests that South Korean students are found to be at the top level in terms of math, reading and science proficiency. The report by the program for International Student Assessment for 2022 was released on Tuesday after conducting surveys on academic achievements and trends of 15-year-old students in 81 countries. Now, South Korea saw its scores rise in all three categories, being ranked in the first to second range for math, first to seventh for reading, and second to fifth for science. An official from the Ministry of Education noted that there was no significant rise in South Korea's achievement level and that the rise was largely attributed to a decline in scores of other countries due to COVID-19. Good morning, I'm Kim Seung and we now turn over to stories from around the world. We begin today in Ukraine, where the Netherlands has announced it will provide Kiev with 2.6 billion US dollars in assistance in 2024. The Dutch Foreign Minister Hanke Bruins Slot, on an official visit on Tuesday, told her Ukrainian counterpart that your fight is our fight, your security is our security. Amid recent concerns of diminishing Western support, Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba said that he did not see any decrease in support coming from partners when it comes to deliveries of weapons and ammunition. 
Perroin's slot also mentioned the Dutch pilot training center in Romania for F-16 fighter jets that opened in November and that talks are being held with the U.S. and Denmark to decide whether Ukraine can deploy the jets as soon as possible. Now to Indonesia, where the death toll from the eruption of the Mount Marapi volcano on Sunday has risen to 22 people. Rescuers found nine more bodies on Tuesday after resuming their search, which had been suspended on Monday due to safety concerns. One person is still missing. There were 75 hikers in the area during the eruption, most of whom were evacuated, although many suffered from burns. Mount Marapi, which means mountain of fire, is around 3,000 meters high and is one of the most active in, of active of Indonesia's 127 volcanoes. The mountain on West Sumatra spewed a three kilometer ash cloud into the air when it erupted on Sunday, blanketing the surrounding region in ash. Moving on to our next story, a Spanish prosecutor has requested a four-year prison sentence on Tuesday for four football fans accused of racial hate crimes against Real Madrid winger Vinicius Jr. They are accused of hanging an inflatable black effigy dressed in a replica of Vinicius Jr.'s number 20 shirt off a bridge near Real Madrid's training ground along with a banner reading Madrid Hates Real. The incident happened ahead of Real's match against local rival Atletico Madrid in January. The four defendants are members of far-right fan group Frente Atletico and have been accused of showing an unequivocal sign of contempt and repudiation of the victim's skin colour and an attempt to undermine the victim's peace of mind. The prosecutor has also requested joint compensation of around $6,500 in moral damage caused to Vinicius Jr. Now, a grim story to end the morning with the death of an American tourist in the Bahamas in a shark attack on Monday. The 44-year-old female was paddleboarding with a companion in waters near the resort in western New Providence Island near the capital Nassau when a shark attacked. A lifeguard came to the aid of the paddleboarders, however the woman had suffered serious trauma to the right side of her body and later died. According to the program director of the International Shark Attack File, there have been a couple of shark-related deaths in the Bahamas in the past five years. On average, about five people a year die from shark attacks. Good morning. The chill will not be the major issue today. It's the dust will be trapped in all day in most places. Southwesterly winds will bring more dust into the country, boosting dust levels to very bad levels in the latter half of the day. Another reason to keep a face mask on today. Then there will be light rain across Korea with less than five millimeters of precipitation expected. Mountainous regions in Gangwon-do province could see snowfall in Instead. Meanwhile, a dry advisory remains in place for some of the East Coast in Busan and Ulsan today. Afternoon highs will be similar to slightly lower this afternoon, so topping out at 10 degrees Celsius this afternoon. But winter seems to be far away on Jeju Island, topping out at 19 degrees this afternoon. Partly sunny skies will be blurred by that fine dust. Today's precipitation will bring a slight chill tomorrow morning, but it won't be too bad. And there will not be a major cold snap for the next five days. Also, air quality should improve tomorrow. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions.
We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. We'll be back tomorrow for Thursday's edition at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time.